Hey guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. Today I'm gonna make a mess and while I'm doing that I have a craft time mystery for you guys. It's a frustrating one, I am not gonna lie, but a lot of the ones I tell are frustrating. This one kind of reminds me of the one I told a few videos ago about Lauren. It's like that, yeah. I think the reason why this one resonated with me is because I used to live in the small town where this happened. I didn't live there when it happened. I lived there previously, but let's just say I'm familiar with procedure in that town and uh, I was not surprised how everything got handled. Yep, that's about as tactful as I can be. And while I'm doing that, I am going to take this. This is cave paper. And cave paper is made from flax. So Belgian flax or Egyptian flax. And it is sold in some specialty paper stores around the world. I bought this directly from the cave paper company. They're not paying me to do this or anything. I We'll put their link down below. Um, I think you can get it at Talus and I don't know if you can get it at Hollanders or not. I ordered just the natural undyed one because I wanted to be able to make whatever color I wanted to make. The great thing about this paper is that it's really strong when it's dry. When it's wet, you can tear it. It's harder than regular paper to tear, but you can tear it. But once it's dry, those flax fibers really interlock and anyway you didn't come here to talk about paper did you <laughs> so you could watch me uh do whatever i'm going to do to this paper and we will talk about this case oh yes the charm and tranquility of a small town now i'm sure many of you have lived in a small town at some point in your life and Maybe you still live in one. The one I'm talking about today is Silver City, an old mining community nestled in the foothills of the Continental Divide in southwestern New Mexico. It's, um, it's artsy, and its quirky siren song draws artists and retirees who want to escape the hustle and bustle of the bigger cities. As you can see, I dressed up for you. <laughs> so this is Cassie Farrington. She was born Cassie Brooks in December of 1990. Cassie was one of those kids that was just generally good at everything. Her dad, Chuck, would describe her as motivated and driven, even when she was a little kid. She worked really hard in school because she wanted to be a doctor. She aced high school in three years, so go Cassie. <laughs> And her senior year, she was part of the National Honor Society, Future Business Leaders of America, and she lettered in five, five sports. But life threw Cassie a curveball, as it often does. It's relatable. And at 16, she found out she was pregnant. So medical school was not going to happen now. Within the span of one month, she graduated from high school, had a healthy baby boy named Tristan, moved out of her parents' house, and got married. She and her husband, Bradley Farrington, would end up moving to Silver City, where he became a police officer and she went to school for nursing. And some of you might be like me, because I think my mama bear came out, and I had to look it up because there wasn't any reporting on it. On any of the information that I could find on this case, nobody mentioned this little tidbit. So it's just me being me. So take it with a grain of salt. But what jumped out at me was the fact that she found out she was pregnant at 16, which that's not uncommon. But how old was the dad, right? So I looked that up. He wasn't 16. Uh, matter of fact, he wasn't 17. And he wasn't 18. He was an adult. The age of consent in Arizona is 18, unless both of the persons involved are, like, still minors. That wasn't the case here. You know, it is what it is, and does it foreshadow, you know, the state of their marriage or how it's going to go? Well, let's find out. I'm going to use some, I think, some paint because the dye 
I don't have any daubers on any of those bottles and don't ask why. Just don't ask. I used them for something else. Anyway. So, um, yeah, the marriage would not be a happy one. And by 2013, they were legally separated and actually started fighting over the custody of the kids. At this point, Cassie is 22 and she starts dating a man named David Barry who adored the kids, adored them. She was renting a small mobile home at the end of Rosedale Road and it was owned by one of her nursing professors named Charnel Lee. And Charnel herself was going through a breakup with her husband, whose name was Billy. Billy was also a nurse and he worked with Cassie at the local hospital. On March 24th, 2014, Cassie finished up her shift. It was a graveyard shift. And she called her mom to let her know some good news, which was that she got a job, was being transferred over to the emergency room. And this is something that she had wanted for a long time, so she was stoked. She told her mom she was going to take a nap before meeting up with her friend Mary. And Darlene told Cassie to get some rest and maybe they could take the kids for ice cream after school. Later that afternoon, Cassie's parents get a call from the school saying that she never came to pick the kids up. And her dad, Chuck, wasn't like freaking out or anything because she had worked a graveyard shift <laughs> and maybe she slept through the alarm on her phone. They called over to Charnel, her landlord, and asked if she would go check in on Cassie. And Charnel lived just right up the driveway, so she just ran down to the mobile home and knocked on the back door. Um, as she was waiting for Cassie to answer, she could see through the window in the back door into the kitchen and she could see that there was water like flowing all over the kitchen floor like in little waves and she kept calling for Cassie but Cassie didn't answer so she ran back up to the house and got a spare key and then came back down to unlock the door. When she unlocked the door, there's like water just coming out and dripping all over the place. And so she can hear the water and it sounds like it's coming from the master bathroom. So she goes into the master bathroom so that she can turn the water off. And that's where she finds Cassie, fully clothed in her nursing scrubs and lying face down in a tub full of water. Charnel immediately flips into nurse mode and pulls Cassie out of the tub to begin CPR. But she quickly realizes that it's, it's too late. Cassie was not breathing and she hadn't been for quite a while. Charnel dialed 911 and started to explain to the dispatcher what was going on. She reaches over and she turns off the faucet in the tub, but she can still hear water running. She gets up and she walks to the other end of the house where the other bathroom was, and that tub was on too, except it wasn't flooding all over the place because the drain was left unplugged, so it was just running down the drain. She also noticed in here that the towel rack that was had been on the wall was broken and yanked off the wall and was laying on the floor next to Cassie's broken glasses. So something bad, something bad happened. It wasn't long before Lieutenant Ray Tavazon and Detective Jose Sanchez shows up. And they noted that, like Charnel did, that it didn't look like there was any forced entry. Like, it didn't look like it was a home invasion or anything. They did say that it looked like some kind of confrontation had happened in the house. Yeah, 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 it did. The dreaded call to Cassie's parents was made, and as soon as they got the news, they 
headed straight for Silver City. When they arrived, the detective asked them if they thought Cassie was suicidal. They were like, are you on crack? No, she's not suicidal. And even though they said emphatically no, he would mention it to them a couple more times. They asked the detective if there were any obvious injuries on her. There was some bruising on her arms. There was some bruising around her neck. It was suspicious, very uh -huh. suspicious. So thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, it's suspicious. And then after just a few hours, the detectives leave the scene and tell Cassie's family, you can go in. And I was like, wait, hold up. Doesn't it take more than a few hours to, um, let's see, you got to remove the deceased. You have to dust for fingerprints swipe for DNA, and tag and collect any evidence. I mean, that's got to take some time, right? Yep. Yeah, it does. However, later it would be revealed that none of the detectives or deputies on scene did any of those things. Police procedure? Never heard of her. When Cassie's family got the courage to enter the bathroom where she was found, they noticed that the tub had not been unplugged. It was still filled with water. When they unplugged the tub and the water drained out, they could see scuff marks all over the inside of the tub, like scuff marks from what shoes would make. In the other bathroom, they saw the broken towel rack and they saw Cassie's broken glasses on the floor and a hair tie. Nobody had bothered to tag these items and collect them for evidence. Even though the detective had said that her death looked suspicious. Yeah, I think this is suspicious. The detectives did return to the scene the next day, you know, after they released it to be compromised by any Joe Blow that walked through it, so. Yeah. They noticed that the carpet in the master bathroom had been taken out. Detective Sanchez was like, well, that's weird. Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff, Detective Sanchez. And when he asked about that, he found out that it was the landlord's husband, Billy, that had removed that carpet. This is the same Billy who had told detectives the day before that he barely knew Cassie. They were also told that Billy helped Cassie get her job that she wanted in the emergency room. So did Billy expect payment for that favor? Did Cassie reject him and set him off? Those were all very good questions. But just a couple of days after Cassie's murder, Billy took off for Alaska. A job opportunity opened up and he picked up and left without Charnel. Even though the police um, saw his behavior as highly suspicious, no attempt was made to um, bring Billy back to answer those questions. Guess that was just way too much effort. Instead, they turn their focus to Cassie's current boyfriend, David Barry. He ended up having a rock solid alibi, but the police would not clear him as a suspect. He was like in another town. He was, he was gone at work that day because he worked like 45 minutes away. He was gone. Supervisor Tavazon asked Detective Sanchez, you know, why didn't you dust for fingerprints? He said he thought the scene was too clean and that nothing of any importance would be found to help with the investigation. Mm -hmm. So nice to know that Detective Sanchez has Superman eyeballs and can see if there's any DNA or fingerprints on surfaces without, you know, dusting or swiping for them. So that's cool. Months went by without so much as a speculation because the police had collected no evidence that would cast suspicion on anybody. To be fair, they didn't collect any evidence, so that goes without saying. Four months later, the report finally came back from the medical examiner. 
and it stated that the cause of death was homicide by undetermined means. The report also stated that she was covered in bruises and had strangulation marks around her neck, thinking we could probably deduce that I don't, maybe she was strangled because of the marks on, but it's a mystery. Okay, all right. As it would happen, six months later, Billy Lee comes back from Alaska. And this gave Detective Sanchez the opportunity to question him about what he knew. Maybe things like, why did you rip out the carpet just a few hours after Cassie died? Or why did you take off for Alaska right after that? I mean, that would be the obvious, right? It would be. It would be the obvious if this was a regular town with regular detectives who did regular police work. But no. No. Nope. He did ask Billy, how well did you know Cassie? Do you work together? Wow. Billy now said though, that instead of just barely knowing her, that they had a good working relationship. But did he have an alibi for that day? He said he and a friend were out of town at his cabin. They were working on the roof when he, or roof, roof, roof. I say roof. I don't say roof, unless I'm saying like roofing. That's roofing, it's not roofing. Yeah, I think it's a where I was raised kind of a thing because nobody from home says roof either. <laughs> the detective asked Billy if he would take a polygraph test, which Billy agreed to. The results came back inconclusive because of course they did, <laughs> but it was not a good look for Billy either way. The detective made a note that he would check on that alibi, which he did a year later, it checked out. So at this point, you are probably wondering, why is it such a hardship for the police in this town to do their job? And who did the people who knew Cassie best think was responsible? All along, Cassie's family was telling police that they knew exactly who did this. Do you remember the estranged ex-husband? The former cop? Yeah, him. But I mean, obviously the police questioned him, right? I mean, that's like investigating 101. That's the first thing you learn is go talk to the spouse. Why am I clapping? But no, no, they did not question him. Detective Sanchez said that he was trying to eliminate everyone else possible as a suspect before he went to talk to Bradley, because apparently Bradley's fragile. At this point, Cassie's family was done. This wasn't just a matter of the wheels of justice moving slowly. This is incompetence. Even worse, could it be that the police were deliberately overlooking their former colleague as a suspect. I feel like I need to be shaking a magic eight ball. So they actually went to the district attorney and when the district attorney, George Zaska, confronted Lieutenant Tavazon, he denied that there was any blue code of cops protecting cops. What was his excuse? Just um, laziness. Fair enough. So, spoiler, Detective Sanchez was removed from the case, thank God, and a new detective was put in his place, and this was Jess Watkins. And the first thing he did was he goes over all the police reports and all of the interviews, and then he listened to the family and also thought it odd that the police had never bothered to interview the estranged husband. And it came out that not only was Cassie and Bradley in a pretty nasty custody battle, but the reason why they split up is because he was abusive. I won't show them, but there are photos of the two little kids with their hands and feet wrapped up with heavy tape and tape over their mouths. And Bradley said that this was a game he played. After they had separated and Cassie started dating David Barry, Tristan would sometimes call David Daddy David. And Cassie always said, don't, don't do that. Your dad's gonna get mad. A few weeks before Cassie died, 
Tristan came home from a visit that he had with his dad and he was terrified. When they asked him what was wrong, he said that daddy said he's going to kill mommy and David. Detective Watkins soon came to the realization that nobody had a motive to hurt Cassie except for that one person that had been purposefully, probably, allegedly overlooked. And then as soon as he looked at the autopsy photos, he was convinced it was a cop that did this. He said that Cassie was murdered by somebody who was trained in police defensive tactics. So five weeks after Detective Watkins was assigned to the case, it had been a year and a half since Cassie died. And he thought it was high time to go talk to Bradley. That took him to Tucson, Arizona, because that's where Bradley had gone and relocated with the kids. He arrested Brad and charged him with first degree murder. Cassie's family at this point was feeling a little bit of relief here because at least something had been accomplished. But you know, then the doubts start to set in because there was no physical evidence to link Brad to this crime. Would a jury even convict him? The prosecuting attorney opened by telling the jury that he was going to be honest. They didn't have a whole lot in the way of evidence. Uh, no evidence was collected um, from the scene and nobody saw Brad enter Cassie's home. And you might find it surprising that the prosecution didn't even call the detective assigned to the case Detective Sanchez as a witness. Okay, well maybe that's not so surprising because I don't think I would have called him either. One notable thing was that the judge allowed in this case, um, which is a little rare, but it happens, he allowed the statements that Cassie had made to others to be admissible as evidence. So uh, one by one, her friends and family would testify about what Cassie had told them about Brad and the abuse that he inflicted on her and the kids. A doctor that serves as a chief medical examiner in San Francisco, so an unbiased party, was brought in to review the autopsy findings. He would point out the telltale signs and explain to the jury that Cassie died of strangulation. Regardless of the fact that the original medical examiner had put down on the autopsy report that it was undetermined means. But the defense attorney was quick to point out that, okay, let's say it was death by strangulation. That doesn't mean that Bradley did it. And then he called the defense star witness to the stand. Want to guess who it is? I'll give you three guesses and the first two don't count. Yeah, our super fun detective Sanchez, who is now retired, probably forcibly retired. I kid you not. Cassie's parents said that the day after Cassie died that the detective did mention in passing that he could see how Bradley could have murdered Cassie and then put her in the tub. But on the stand, he would spin another tale. Mr. Farrington, a suspect in your, in your not, investigation. Not my suspect, no. I was focused already on Mr. Lee. Why did you choose to focus on Mr. Lee? There was just too many discrepancies. So did the defense blow enough smoke to create reasonable doubt? What would the jury decide? We find the defendant, Bradley Farrington, guilty of first degree murder. Yep, life. With no parole for at least 30 years. At this point, Bradley Farrington did file an appeal. And of course, he was aching that the judge allowed the hearsay evidence from friends and family about what Cassie had told them about his alleged, you know, abuse. The Supreme Court, however, concluded that the hearsay testimony was admissible under certain legal exceptions and concluded that Bradley Farrington used his position 
and authority in law enforcement to silence his victim and that the verdict rendered by the original jury would continue to be supported. So, appeal denied. Sadly, Cassie's parents didn't just lose a daughter. Her children, Tristan and Lila, live with their other set of grandparents who to this day will not let Chuck and Darlene see them. So, wow, crazy, right? I told you, small towns are shifty. And Silver City isn't just shifty, it is tripping balls. All right, guys, well, that is it for this one. Let me know in the comments what you think about this case or if there are any other cases that you would like me to cover. Thank you all for hanging out with me today and watching paint dry, literally. I hope everybody has a great weekend and I will see you really, really soon in the next video. Bye, guys.